Hello, this is Christo de Nincha, and it's time for a monthly update about the state of DB48X, specifically about version 0712, which was released today. And um, I'm going to show you a number of radically exciting features since the last time I did a video, which was on 078. So the first interesting feature that I'd like to share with you is the existence of a web-only version of the, the, the calculator which you can find on the site 48cat.org, 48cat.org, so that's here. And um, let me click on the calculator, and you see that this is a functional calculator where you can actually do operations in it. And there's some help to show the kind of things that you can do. Um, this has been tested on on iPhone and Android phones, um, though the formatting is not perfect for these devices, so there's some work to be done there. And also, um, I'd like to have a real iPhone version at some point. Okay, so back to the device itself. In terms of what's new, uh, let's start by loading the state file called demo. So let me load. That's shipped with the firmware. And you see that when we enter the demo, we start in this state where we have an equation with three variables called A, A, B, B, and C, C. And you see that they contain units. So that's one of the examples that is found in one of the user's manual of the HP 48, I think. And um, we used to have issues with that because it has different units for the various values. And in that case, um, we have length units for all three, but um, we want to have a result in centimeters. So we initialized CC with a value of one centimeter and we are going to solve for it. So I hit shift and then F4 to select the solver for this variable, and it's telling me that it has a sign reversal. So what sign reversal means is that it did not find an exact value here. Uh, let me check what we have by hitting evert a few, and you see that it tells me that the left and right values are computed in, um, so for, for the, the left term, uh, it's computed in square feet, and the right term in square centimeters. So it's hard to compare, but the difference between the two, as you can see, is fairly small. So let me get back to the solver menu here, and you see that we have two new menu entries on second shift um, F5 and F6, which are the imprecision of the solver, the number of digits you're willing to give up, and the number of iterations you're ready to do uh, to find the solution. So let's shift to eight digits, sorry, to eight digits uh, of imprecision. So that's eight digits at the bottom where we are ready to, to let go of that. Um, and you see that we have 24 digits total by default. We are on minus 17, so let's try to solve that way. Let me check with the solve menu and back to solving for CC, and now it's finding the solution without complaining that it did not find it. So let me initialize with something different. For instance, let me have a length unit here of 10 yard, and I'm going to use this as the value for the default value for CC. And now I'm solving for CC and we're going to have a result in yard. Okay, so another thing that is new as well is that you have the ability to uh, evaluate different equa uh, equations in the same variable. So let me use that with next a Q here. And you see that 
I have the various equations that deal with uh, solving the triangle problem. And that's again an example from the user manual in the HP48, or I think this one is HP15. And what this looks like, so that's uh, the equation that I have for that. But if I look at the variable containing the equation itself, I'm going to see that it's a list that contains all the equations that I want to put in it. So in other words, if you put a list of equations inside the equation variable, then you can go from one to the next simply with next to two. So that's very convenient. Um, and, uh, so we, we saw that we can also evaluate the equations directly. So uh, if there is no left and right, so for instance, let's say that I put something like this, uh, x minus, sorry, minus 3, and I store that as my equation. So let me store that uh, in the equation. And now if I solve, if I do evaluate equation, Ah, yes, that you see that it's just giving me the evaluated version. There is no x at this time. So let me solve that. Um, and let me solve it for x. So it finds a value 3, which is not very surprising. And now if I do a round of the expression we see that we, we found a solution to 22 digits we could probably do better or something like that so let me store that in the equation again to not lose it and, um, so now the reason i'm doing all this work on equations is to be able to deal with the equation library that exists on the HP 50. So you see that I started entering the columns and beams here. And um, if I look for the help for that, so I started typing the help, it's not it's just copy paste of the help on the advanced reference manual. And uh, so we have one equation and you see that we now have pictures inside the help. So if I go directly to what, to the corresponding equation here and I ask for help, I'm going to see uh, that picture explaining the wrong So I just simply took the pictures from the manual. Um, at some point, we'll have to redo these pictures to, to something that takes advantage of the higher resolution. But for now, it's essentially a copy paste of the equation. Notice that we can use um, multiple equations uh, in the elastic blocking case, for instance, we have a variety of um, we have a list of equations and you see that we have variables with units. And so if you solve for one of these directly, you're going to be asked for units. So if you enter a value for PCI, it's going to enter in that case, it's going to use kilonewtons because that's the default unit that is specified in the equation itself. And you see the equation that you are solving at the top of the screen. Let me exit that. And you see that I exited the menu with exit. Uh, someone actually uh, wanted uh, a new setting to be able to not have this behavior. And so this is something that is now part of the UI menu, I believe. And we have um, two new settings. So we can exit uh, menus with exit. So I can toggle that off. And when that's off, if I hit exit, you see that my menu stays. And if I reactivate it, if I exit, the menu disappears. And um, another request from the same person was to be able to hide the menu. So 
if I click on hide menu like this, I'm sorry, disable hiding menu, and now I exit the menu and I get a blank menu instead of um, having nothing at the bottom of the, of the screen. The rest of the behavior of the computer has changed. The idea there is that notably if you have no variable in the vast menu, then it's more convenient that way. So this is a matter of preference. I prefer to hide the, the behavior that was the default and is still the default, but at least you can now customize it if that's your preference. So we saw some graphics in help. Uh, this is also uh, a good way to talk about the reorganization of the, the constant and equation files. So first of all, the config slash constants.csv, equation.csv, units.csv, and so on, are now for extensions only. So the beatings are shown, and the extensions show at the beginning. So in that case, the config file only contains the date specification, and the rest is coming from the firmware itself. So you can still override that, but um, so we have, for instance, the mathematical constants, and let's see the help for the pi constants. And you see that we have a lot more text now. And we have these nice graphics. Now, another improvement that is very useful in practice is that if I scroll down like this, um, we used to have a slowdown over time due to some performance issue. You see that now I can really scroll through pages and pages, and it stays, it keeps scrolling at constant speed. So that's that's really convenient compared to what we had before. Okay, so the other big topic since last time I did the demo is the interactive stack. So let me enter 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 4, 4, 4. And now I hit the up, so like this. And I enter this interactive stack mode, and let me, for instance, duplicate the n levels of stack into one and three. So you see this dub n on F1. And now I duplicated the stack, and I have uh, these elements. I can echo uh, one stack element on the command line. For instance, I can echo this one. And now I'm starting to. Uh, uh, have data entered in the, um, on the command line directly, so I can pick up objects from the stack and put them on the command line, but I'm not editing. If I hit one, for instance, or two or three, I'm selecting the label uh, on the stack. I need to hit exit before I'm back to the editor and I can change it. Now, there is a small difference between this behavior and the way that HP48, for instance, was doing it. Uh, which is that the echo inserts a space to separate the stack elements. The idea is probably that you will pick up values uh, from the stack and then you want to do operations on it. But if you want to have the HP behavior of echoing without space, you can do that uh, with this echo and SP, and then you can paste elements from the stack directly. You can also um, uh, show uh, a given level on the stack, so that would be more interesting if I do that with, for instance, uh, let me add a variable like this. Oh, X has a name now. Let me approach X. So right, I'm just trying to purge the same X here. And so then I can do multiply by X to have an expression. And um, and then I take the square root of that and uh, invert of that thing. Um, and uh, back to the interactive stack. So now if I uh, hit the swap key here, I'm going to move that up. 
move it up and I can select with dot or with show to show the stack elements graphically. Um, so for very big values, that's also very useful. That's the usual show value. So same thing with that too. Um, Evan will evaluate that value. So in that case, it's not going to do anything because the value is uh, um, the value in X, uh, but I can, for instance, let me do an expression like this. Uh, times three times four, and uh, let me swap that and move it up. So, oops. I can evaluate something deep in the stack directly like this. I can roll the stack up and down. Uh, so the four. So let me go the higher level of the stack like this, and I can roll interactively like this. So this is convenient as well. I can pick um, a value. So for instance, level six here. I'm going to put it on level one. So if I go back to level one like this, go back shortly to level six. I can edit the value so that, for instance, let's say I want to edit this object here. I can edit it directly and I can remove, for instance, all these extra edges that I don't want. And let me make it uh, an integer value. Yes. And so I edit my object directly. I can also have information about each level of the stack. You see that this equation is taking this number of bytes. And you have the checksum. And um, this, for instance, integer is taking two bytes. Um, I can convert some levels of the list, the, the stack to a list, like this. Um, I can eliminate anything above a given level. So for instance, let me keep only the three levels that I have there. So that's with keep. And when I have values like this, I can also decide to uh, swap them. So, sorry, to solve them. So let me do this. So I can sort my levels on the stack like this uh, with a value sort or a sort by the representation in memory, which is useful if you have types, that, uh, objects that have different types. So this one is the sort that will always be deterministic, but it depends on the type of the object. And I can also revert the, 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 the levels of stack between one and seven. So if I revert again, I'm going to get back to my stack level as before. So pretty powerful interactive stack. Um, let me duplicate also, again, my seven levels here. Now I have more than 10 levels. So if I hit 11, for instance, I get to 11. If I hit two, I'm going to level 12. So that's for the interactive stack. Now, another part of the user interface that was uh, modified quite significantly is the history. So if I go to history like this, uh, so that gives me the last history that I edited. And you see that I switched to the editor uh, menu right away. And one of the benefits, if, if I go on the world left here, I'm going to scroll through the history. And so that's a good way to quickly go through the command line history. You also have the uh, explicit history previous and history next to directly go to a value if you want. And the rest of the editor uh, is uh, quite similar. And another interesting thing is while you're editing like this, 
you can also shift to the stack, the interactive stack, for instance, let's say that you want to grab this value here with a code SP. Oh, that's surprising. I was expecting it to paste it to the cursor. Um, that's probably worth fixing. I don't think that's the intended behavior. So it's always good when I do demos, I always find some interesting issues like this. Okay, um, then we have more minor things. Uh, one of them is when you enter complex numbers. So let's say I enter 10 and um, I put a phase like this. You see that now I'm by default in degrees. But let's say that I want to enter something in radians. So now I can do this. I can grade uh, 100, for instance. And I go to mode, which gives me the angle modes. And I can say that I want to have 100 grads. And that converts it to 90 degrees. So that's a good way to uh, shift quickly while you're entering data between. Um, Another feature that was added is a random number generator. Uh, so that's um, all under number, if I recall correctly. Um, so you can have a, a random number between 0 and 1, like this. Um, you can have a random number between two values, um, 1.2 and 2.5, for instance, and I hit random, and it's going to give me a value between, so let me use the history here to do that. Uh, and you get a different value here. If the numbers are integers, then random is going to give me something between, so let's let's make a dice for instance. Um, that will give me an integer value between one and six, and I will get one and six. So the limits are included in the case where you use integer values. So I got a six here. The random number generator can be altered with the seed, so you can put any kind of object as a seed here. So let me put a seed like this and, um, and you get the next random number. Oops. So what I wanted was that's my seed. And uh, Seed, and now if I hit random number, so that's the digits I get. If I use the same, the same seed, you get exactly the same value. And I can also, so the number, the random number generator is called ACOR. And uh, you can select the number of bits that you want in terms of randomness and the, the number of iterations or the order of the echo generator. Um, and so you can, for instance, let's say you want to do computations with 100 digits, then you would need more than 128 bits to have all the digits be random. So you can configure it that way. You pay the price if you need it. And I think that's about everything I wanted to show for this quick demo. Oh, one, one thing that was added in the demo bench, in the demo directory is something that uses the random numbers to do a random plot. I have a state that doesn't give me, that gives me black pixels. So let me 
Resets the graphical state. And over this is the problem. So I always have to end my demos with something that doesn't work. Select the value width of one. Hmm. So we have to understand why this demo doesn't work. It should. Uh, so Okay, there is definitely something that doesn't work with this demo. I saw it working, so... Oh, it is working. It's just that I was not patient enough. So it's doing an actual random plot and the pixels are so small that you don't see them on the graphics. So that's, I, I was simply probably not waiting long enough. So it's essentially one uh, plotting random point on the screen, and uh, that's precisely so that you can see that uh, there is no pattern that emerges uh, in how the feeling is being done. Okay, I think that's that's it for the demo today. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed that.